All right, guys. Our next to the last review here we, is a freezing cold Wednesday. Uh, try and warm it up a little bit here. And I can't get my lights right. I'm getting blinded here. So uh, if you can't see me, oh well. All right, yesterday we did absolutism in the Mughal Empire. And we did absolutism in the Ottoman Empire. Just had a great question from Kyle about the absolutism practice DBQ. I hope that makes sense there, uh, Kyle. Anyhow, um, today we're going to do Japan and we're going to do Ming Dynasty China. And tomorrow is trade routes. Also, next week I'm going to send you a reminder. Make sure to log in early. A lot of the AP Human Geo students had trouble logging in, but if they kept at it, uh, after several minutes, they were able to get in. So make sure that half hour before you guys are logging in with all of your documentation sitting there for you. Okay, so as it comes to Japan, now Japan we know um, is going to be weird because there is the emperor, all right, the descendant of the sun that is the official head of the country. But starting with Minamoto Yoritomo, the chief executive, like the prime minister, so to speak, is going to be the shogun. And so here, by 1630, you know, um, after 1300 years, Japan has evolved, all right, and they are still undergoing the medieval feudalism that had existed for eons. And then. There was a period of civil war, very similar to the, to the time of troubles in Mother Russia. And it is at this time that there were three warlords. One was named Nobunaga, another one was Hideyoshi, and the other one was Tokugawa Iyasu. And then there was the legend of, of the songbird, where in the morning, before this climactic battle, you know, Hideyoshi says, if that songbird doesn't sing, I'm going to kill it. Nobunaga says, if that songbird doesn't sing, I'm going to make it sing. And Tokugawa says, I'm going to wait for the song to sing on its own. Then its sound will be the most beautiful um, of all. And so the next day, there is this enormous battle as, you know, Hideyoshi, without waiting, runs in there and tries to, you know, bull his way to victory. And then Nobunaga quickly follows suit. He is going to make victory happen. And Tokugawa kind of waits till the battle is underway. Everyone is fighting. And then he swoops in and destroys everything because he was patient. And so Tokugawa Yasu is going to become the Shogun. And he is going to set some policies into motion that after his death will be turned into the national policy of seclusion, which will affect Japan up until Admiral Perry sails into Tokyo Bay in the Industrial Revolution. So he is going to use his tremendous military power, very similar to Mayhead and Suleiman and Peter the Great, to use things, his military background, his efficiency, general, colonel, major, captain, first lieutenant, second lieutenant, to streamline Japan and he will build a new capital in Edo, which is modern-day Tokyo. And so here is this painting where you can see the whole big battle, you know, taking place, all the carnage. And then Tokugawa's guys are up here kind of waiting, letting the melee to happen, everyone to get weak and tired. And then his victory from the flank comes in and is just a devastating, devastating victory. And Tokugawa is going to do something very similar to what Louis XIV and Peter the Great did, um, but it's literally going to be known as the hostage system here in Japan. First thing he is going to do is he's going to redraw the Japanese domains. A domain is like a little kingdom or a fiefdom in which you know, an upper lord, in this case a daimyo. So in Europe, we have king, we have upper lord. Well, in Japan, we have Emperor, Shogun, and then the Daimyo is going to be the Upper Lord, and the Samurai are going to be the Smaller Knights. So, the domain under feudalism is an area that the ruler controls. 
And so what Tokugawa is going to do is he's going to confiscate all the lands from his defeated enemies. And then he is going to redistribute it. Instead of killing his rival daimyo, he is going to relocate 229 of them. If you were in the south, he's going to relocate you north. And if you were north, south, and if you were east, west, west, east, he's going to disconnect you from your common people, from the people who you are um, familiar with, to break all those loyalty ties. And then he is going to choose this red area. This is the first domain, the biggest part of Japan where most people live. That is what Tokugawa is going to centrally control himself. Now, he is going to staff that. He's going to turn daimyos into people who were his most trusted samurai, people who were loyal to him, people he had known for a long time. They are going to be his most trusted inner ring of defense. There's Tokugawa, and then he's going to divvy out you know, smaller plots of land to govern with his most trusted, uh, trusted samurai. The second domain, kind of like the blue and the gold and the green here, and the Carolina blue, are going to be filled with not only um, samurai who show royalty, but relatives who are blood related. They are of the Iyasu, you know, Tokugawa Iyasu's family. You know, loyalty is deeply ingrained in Japan. And then number three, the last one, way far away, are the outside daimyo. These are the guys who he re relocated. If by chance there is a weird foreign invasion, they're going to get it first. And if they want to try to assassinate and attack Tokugawa, they've got to go through his family members and his hardcore inner ring um, supporters. So there's really no way Tokugawa is going to be um, attacked. And so he looks at the government. You know, Japan becomes cyclical where they're going to do those same three offices. Well, Tokugawa wants to make things uh, efficient, even more so than they were. So he draws up new simplified legal codes to help govern and run a large governing bureaucracy. And what he realizes he needs is men of ability, right? So if you were proven with your leadership, if you were a good samurai, you become a daimyo. If you were a good daimyo, you control more territory or you advise Tokugawa um, directly. I want guys who have proven leadership experience. I need smart guys. I need decision makers. I know I need guys who can handle their own problems and not come begging me for everything. So these daimyos were entrusted with a lot of power. However, very similar to Suleiman, the daimyos under Tokugawa were held to a higher standard of behavior. Tokugawa elevated you there because you're supposed to know what to do, so you better do it or else. And then he institutes the hostage system, where for one year, an outlying daimyo must come live in Edo with his family where Tokugawa can keep an eye on you. The following year, the daimyo goes back to his um, remote domain, but the family stays behind to ensure their loyalty. If you do anything to me, I have your family. So they alternate year to year. It's called the alternate year attendance plan, which is going to have some unforeseen benefits for the people of um, Japan. Now, as Tokugawa does this, he decides to open up the economy. The farms and villages had been ravaged from years of civil war. And a lot of resources that were put into fighting and weapon making are now going to be redistributed and applied to agriculture. So we're going to get, you know, metal garden implements. We're going to find a quicker way to separate, um, to thresh the wheat from the chaff to get flour. We're going to plant new crops. We are going to invent technology. Everything, when you're not fighting, you can take ideas and adapt them to civilian life. Technology that will make things a whole lot easier. So not only does the agriculture boom because of this technology, but new crops are going to be um, introduced. 
And as a result, there is a population boom that takes place inside Japan. Now, merchants also are going to benefit here. A national economy is going to begin to grow. Before this, an artist and a skilled laborer or a merchant only traded with their lord, with their daimyo, or in his domain. But now that there's no fighting, merchants are free to travel up and down the coastlines of Japan and buy, trade, and sell items. And so this integrates northern and southern in the separate, you know, the archipelago of Japan. This integrates everybody in a national Japanese economy begins to grow. And by 1635, the alternate year attendance plan really helps out. When the daimyos had to travel from the south or the north to Edo, they found out that there were no real good roads. The mountain passes were very tight with the geography. Some rivers didn't have bridges over them. Um, there were no boats to ferry them to Edo in some places. So they began to build roads and an infrastructure system. They begin to build bridges. They have little inns and rest stops. They set up a, a ferry system. Think of going you know, out to the um, outer banks. A ferry system to get people there. And so with these new roads, um, it's just like in Europe a couple hundred years earlier after the Crusades, all those new towns were built up. And so now Japanese um, daimyo, who had very skilled artisans, began to go out and recruit them. They had to give their quota to the emperor, and then whatever their artisan, once that tax was paid, they could produce more and sell it for cash profit. The artisan gets to keep some, and the daimyo gets to keep some. So Japan is rocking and rolling. Everything is great. Everything is functioning well. And then one of the ideas that, that Tokugawa set forth before he died was, look, we're isolated. We have no problems. We don't want any outside influence. We have really perfected civilization. So at this point, they drop down the national policy of seclusion. This is like the, the dark ages of Europe. Few people, if any, are going to leave Japan, and only a tiny bit of Jesuit missionaries and Dutch traders are going to show up. But Japan has essentially been um, closed off. All right. Now, Tokugawa, to rewind to him, knows that he cannot control everything. All right. So like, like Louis, like Peter, like, you know, Akbar, he says, my job is to control national problems. Like we talked about the other day, if the stoplight at the corner of high school and Homestead Road goes out because of construction, that is Taylor's problem to fix. She has to fix that. The emperor doesn't have time. And so by the year 1700, right, when we're, you know, for where absolutism is rocking and rolling in Western Europe, Japan had reached the limit of their expansion. Right? They are able to stay disciplined within the structure they had created for themselves. Um, they limit the number of children that they have. They don't overdo the food production. They don't clear useless land. The Japanese do an incredible job. Now, you know, there's going to be that cyclical pattern, and eventually... Um, Japan is going to sustain that all the way until Commodore Perry shows up in 1853. So this is going to bring us to the Ming Dynasty of China. And in 1368, right, we're going to rewind back into our um, time frame here. So I'm sorry I kind of shortened Japan, but I want you to focus primarily on Tokugawa um, Iyasu. Ming Dynasty can get kind of large here. So, the Ming Dynasty, um, by 1368, all right, um, we're going to have the Ming Dynasty. They are the last true dynasty, true Chinese dynasty in China. And under the great Ming Dynasty, it's kind of like, you know, the Tang and the Song and the Han before. It is this great dynasty in China's long history. In it... Japan, China, excuse me, doing both today. 
China's population is going to double. And there's going to be 600 years of sustained growth. This is what Pax Romana was to ancient Rome. This is China's version of Pax Romana. 600 years of sustained, awesome you know, growth inside the country. Now, there's going to be some good emperors, and there's going to be some weak emperors, but the dynasty is going to exist because of that good old Confucian scholar system. And it's going to start here with Emperor Zhu Yuanzhen. And like everybody else, he starts out as a, as a conqueror. And as he begins to expand his territory, he begins to switch from an economy that had a lot of monopolistic controls to one more of a laissez-faire economy. Like I talked about in Japan, where the merchants were able to, and artisans were able to produce their quota for the Japanese emperor and then sell it for themselves. And so families like the Hondas and the Toyotas jumped on that. Well, the same thing happens here in China. Laissez-faire business, you guys take care of that for yourselves. And what really helps out China is the growth of senshi banks. Think of like the Bank of America. It was the Bank of China where there were, you know, branches from Shanghai all the way to Nanking. So you could deposit your money in one branch, get your letter of credit, travel all the way to Nanking, withdraw money from that bank, buy your trade items cheaply at the source, and take whatever you have left over and put it back in the bank. So it helps grow the Chinese banking system, which helps trade. Merchants are traveling. They're going north to south. The Grand Canal is, is widened and, and cleaned up. And Ming China is just rolling. And it's here where, like a lot of our other primetime rulers, China is not just going to build a new palace. They are going to build an entire complex known today as the Forbidden City. And in the center of it is where the emperor rules. That's when you go through that doorway and you come in and the emperor is sitting up there on his throne chair. And he looks, you know, magnificent and you feel a very humbled and small. This complex was built for the governing of national China. Not just a palace, but a real life city. And helping advise the emperors, like Zhu, are the old Confucian officials. And here is where the Confucian civil service test really pays off. So you know, you take that test when you've gone to school, and there's a Confucian school in every town and village. And if you pass, you're sent to govern a small town, where you work on it for five, ten years, you are evaluated, if you do a good job, you will be invited to take a second test. And if you pass that test, all right, you are given um, a mid-sized town or a small city like a Durham or a Raleigh. And you govern that for a while. If your evaluations are good enough, you take the final test, test number three. And if you pass that, again, only one in every 100 pass. These exams are like the AP World Test we're about to take. It's one shot, one, one time. You either do well or you do not. If you pass that third test, you can govern a large city like in Atlanta, New York, or Chicago, or you can even advise the emperor directly. These tests were ultra competitive. You were set in a little cubicle where you went in, they said, like the silkworm, and hopefully you burst forth like the beautiful a butterfly if you passed. But B were this was serious, hardcore, ultra um, competition. And what this does is it forms an unbroken chain from the emperor in the Forbidden City to the large East Coast trading cities to the mid-sized town way out to the countryside. An unbroken chain of trained, efficient, good moral scholars from the emperor to the tiniest little village. And so here you go from you know, you know, Beijing along the Great Wall all the way back and all the way out. And this is going to be the territory controlled by the early Ming emperors. But remember, the Ming, a good Chinese dynasty, always expands. So 
the Ming are going to you know, conquer down into what is today Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Laos, um, Cambodia, and their great, um, wonderful sailors. So here is a, a you know, Portuguese man of war or a Spanish sailing vessel from the flotilla system. And this is one of the Chinese trading ships led by the great Admiral Zhang He or Chang Ho. And he is going to go out with this trading fleet and he's going to go over to India as far away as Africa. And these ships were giant and they had those colorful sails and those headpieces like, you know, a butterfly, a bird, and a bumblebee. And their job was to display Chinese power and conquest. And when the fleet would roll up and you would see these 68 large, giant, big ships, and you would be asked if you wanted to be absorbed into the Chinese Empire. If you said yes, you had to take a piece of tribute, something that was very valuable, and present it to the emperor. If he accepted it, then you were absorbed into China. You could trade with China, you were protected by China. You just did the same three things as always. You paid your taxes, you um, acknowledged the emperor as your emperor, and gave soldiers to the army. If you refused, then you were physically conquered. And a lot of people think Zhang Ho actually made it across the Pacific and landed in Chile and saw the rocky, nasty shore and the tall, jagged Andes Mountains. So he turned around and um, came back. Had he landed a little farther north, who knows what North and South America would look like. But there again, there's the Spanish vessel, and here is Zhang He's. It's like a sailboat compared to an, an aircraft carrier. Now... This is the point where China is in charge of their imports and their exports. And there's not one single emperor we're talking about. It is a 600-year dynasty of the Ming, started by Zhu Yuanzhang. But foreigners would come in, Portugal, Spain, whatever. After being on a ship for six or eight months, they got off the ship and they behaved badly in in. China. They got drunk. They started fights. They, you know, attacked people. Did all kinds of crazy things. So the Ming Emperor says, no, I'm going to restrict you to the port of Canton. And it becomes known as the Cantonese system, where there was a spit of land, like a small island. And the foreign ships could dock up there. They could unload their cargo from where that little island or spit kind of widens and narrows onto mainland China, they built a miniature Great Wall, and it had guards. And foreigners could not go beyond that gate into mainland China. Now, Chinese merchants could go out, they could open up, you know, brothels and pubs and restaurants, but when the day was over, all the Chinese came back inside the gate, and the foreigners stayed out. So this is the price of doing business with China. If you want to trade with us, you will abide by our rules. That one was pretty quick. Um, give me a minute here. I'll see if I can call a different one up um, that is more detailed. I don't know if I can find it um, quickly enough or not. Uh, but that should pretty much do it. Um, here we go. Uh, the age of absolutism. This thing is massive. So we do so many of these absolute um, monarchs, Peter the Great, da 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 da, Suleiman, I think we just did him yesterday. This might be the exact same one. Yep, so it is. So anyway, guys, that is the age of absolutism in China and in Japan. Um, tomorrow we'll do some trade routes, and I will talk to you guys soon. If you have any questions, please let me know.